video will be will be available on YouTube. Please Dan, I'll give you I'll give you the voice to right. um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, that's that's always good. Uh, so thank you for the extremely comprehensive introduction um, and also for for the invitation um, and for sort of the effort of setting uh, everything up. So uh, today I'll talk a bit about our work over the past couple of years uh, at the intersection of theory and practice in distributed computing. And um, yeah, uh, I, before I uh, start, I want to say uh, I'm very happy to take questions. So the way I try to set it up is that uh, I'll have like some natural checkpoints during the talk when, when I'll stop and, and I'll check the chat box. And at that point, perhaps uh, Thomas or, or um, uh, someone else can maybe help me with reading the, um, the questions or something. Like that. So just a moment ago, some, somebody wrote that volume is a bit low. So pro <clears throat> okay. All right. um, we thought it's okay. To... So okay. Um, maybe if you put it in the direction that you are moving directly to yeah, microphone. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to avoid, but uh, right. okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I, I hope this is fine. All right. So, Much better. Um, sounds good. So yeah, so what am I talking about where I mean uh, relaxed distributed systems? Um, I mean, I'll start with kind of a, a very broad overview, uh, which, which probably is, is not new to uh, most of you. So essentially the world is really moving towards distributed computing as kind of the default uh, way of operation. We have multiple cores among which work has to be done, whether it's in an Apple watch or in a uh, Intel Xeon Phi. So essentially, uh, it, it, like distributed and distributing sort of multi-core computation is kind of um, standard these days. We have sort of standard applications of distributed computing in supercomputing and cloud computing. And we have uh, these kind of new emerging types of distributed computation, which, which are pretty exciting and are kind of changing the rules uh, of the game as we go along. So the point of um, my talk uh, at a very high level is that, I mean, most of the world's computing is distributed and scalability as by which I broadly mean essentially the ability of an algorithm to perform more work or more useful stuff as the number of participants uh, grows is kind of a key uh, requirement from, from algorithms. And then like this actually changes the way that we design algorithms that we implement them and actually you deploy them in practice. Okay, so I'll try to give you a couple of uh, just two instances of that. So my research is basically uh, focused on algorithm data structures and architectures for scalable distributed computation. And I try to combine uh, some kind of steal some nice ideas from theory and uh, apply them into software. And sometimes we kind of even have to look at hardware and whether this can be improved. And in particular, uh, today I'll talk about two highlights from, from the work we've done. So um, scalable applications to scalable training of deep neural networks and uh, a bit about relaxed concurrent data structures. So uh, before I go into, start going into details, I, I, I just try to, sort of see if there, there is a common theme uh, sort of uh, connecting, connecting my work over the past couple of years. And one thing that seems to be um, clearly a pattern is that our research cycle usually starts here. At, we try to work on real problems. And then we sort of take the problems and make them into something that uh, is not practical anymore. We sort of uh, ma 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 model the, the, the problem mathematically. And then we start kind of trying to solve the underlying algorithmic problem. And this is where a lot of energy, coffee, and time is being spent. And then we kind of try to go back and see if the, the solution we came up with still makes sense in the real world. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But one thing that we, we I notice uh, that happens um, sort of very often is that at this point, it, it, I mean, especially if you're trying to obtain fairly, very highly scalable solutions, relax semantics or like essentially trying to take the uh, sort of nicely encapsulated uh, theoretical problem and sort of break it apart and sort of relax the guarantees seems to be something that's happening more and more as our field is driven more and more by applications. Okay, so I'll give you two examples of that. And maybe we can discuss at the end whether you agree uh, that this is a trend or not, or whether this is something new or not. Or uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'm very happy to take your opinion, like the opinion of, of the Sirocco community, uh, on on my simple observations. So the first, so as I said, we always try to start from a real problem. So the first 
real problem that I'll throw at you today is training with large machine learning models efficiently. Okay, and this is a this is a problem where I, uh, a surprisingly high fraction of the world's flops is being spent right now, because these models are turned out turns out they are kind of doing interesting things. So basically um, the ingredients for training an accurate uh, large scale machine learning models is a lot of data. So basically I gave you, I'm giving you here a couple of numbers. So basically to train an accurate image classification model, you need uh, millions to tens of millions to even billions of images of single samples that the model learns from. And then if you are uh, turn, uh, learn, if you're training a speech model, then um, companies such as Microsoft will, will uh, use at least in the order of tens of thousands of hours of speech. And what I think, one thing that's kind of worth noting here is that this is really uh, like a, a comparable amount of data to, uh, in terms of hours of speech, for instance, to what a child will hear until they actually start to recognize language. So it's really in the, the same order as, as uh, sort of um, um, our own systems, even though the, obviously the, the inner workings and the complexity are, is, is very different. And uh, so you need, I have, I assume you have a lot of data and then usually what, what you need in order to learn from this data is, is a large model. And I, by large here, I'll just count the number of single parameters which have to be optimized sort of jointly in order for the model to become accurate. And I'm giving you a couple of numbers here uh, for convolutional neural networks, which kind of basically look like this. It's just like a lot, a lot of layers kind of stacked on top of each other. And uh, we, we have gotten to the point where um, language generation models uh, or text generation models are, have in the order of billions or even hundreds of billions of parameters in order to, uh, to, to um, sort of create uh, impressive chunks of text, okay? So you have, on the one hand, you have a lot of data. So you essentially, uh, like there's no single computational device on earth that's able to process this amount of data in um, a very short span of time. So what people do is that they parallelize the computation, they split the data among multiple devices, usually multiple GPUs, TPUs, IPUs, whatever you want to call them. And uh, th at the same time, they need to train these large models jointly over this data. So they will actually need to synchronize very, it's like very frequently between these computational devices. And this creates inherently a tension between the number of nodes that you actually can distribute to and the speed at which, or like the overheads that you get from, from this. So I, I wanna give you a very simple illustration of this, of what, what actually ends up happening. And this is an experiment I ran a couple of years ago on Europe's top supercomputer, which is located in Lugano. So it has a, a few thousand GPU nodes, state-of-the-art network. And this, I just tried to run a simple image classification task or something that used to be state-of-the-art at the time. Um, and in my single node, sort of a sing on a single GPU, then my training time on this data set would have been 19 days, okay? And this is a bit much to wait for a sort of single experimental data point. And if I were able to use a, a fraction of what this supercomputer can give me, I should be done in about 20 minutes, okay? So this is the, what the theory says. So let's see what happens if I try to run this on TensorFlow, which is a um, sort of kind of state of the art. Um, um, sort of a training framework. So uh, on the x-axis, I'll have the number of nodes and on the y-axis, I have the number of days that it takes me to train this model. Okay, so notice on two nodes, I actually have, I'm taking about 9.6 days to train. So basically I've more or less halved my, my running time, but notice that there is this slight smidgen of, of overhead for two nodes. And then at four nodes, we all, again, like almost have, but there's again, like a bit more overhead. And at, three, uh, at eight nodes, we actually get to 3.2 days. So again, like almost having, but, but overhead increases slightly. But notice that uh, like uh, the last point at which we actually still get a reduction in, in running time is at 16 nodes. And after that, it actually kind of embarrassingly, it actually starts to, to like the, our running time starts to increase. So then if we actually go a bit deeper and sort of uh, benchmark so that we can see how much is spent on computation by the node and how much is spent on communication, we'll actually get this picture here, which is where the green part is the useful part, which is the actual 
computation done by the node. And the red part is the communication, which is just pure overhead. These nodes are essentially, this is the time spent by nodes essentially trying to communicate in order to keep their models in sync. And notice that this really starts to grow and it, it sort of becomes kind of ridiculously high at uh, 64 nodes, which actually also explains um, this, these sort of relatively bad results because only 10% of time is now spent on computation and the rest of time is pure distribution overhead, okay? So the, my point of this very simple illustration is uh, that uh, it's, it's still non-trivial to distribute these uh, tasks at scale. And this is something that's widely recognized in the, in the community, okay? So um, we, we spent some time trying to make this problem better and to some extent, uh, some limited extent we succeeded. So I wanna maybe go a bit over the, um, some of the things we noticed along the way, okay? So um, basically before I can sort of go into the solutions, I still I have to explain the problem a little better. So the problem we're looking at is essentially a uh, variant of, in some sense, it's, it's kind of a variant of mean estimation uh, among a large set of nodes in a synchronous system, but it's a kind of a very fancy version. So let me sort of try to break it up into single components. So we have a synchronous message passing system. There are no, not even failures, like we, we're like in all to all clique, fully connected, everything is fine, no failures. And then uh, we have each node having a set of samples. And what happens is that they first draw samples and they compute some gradients, essentially encoding the updates that they would like to do to the model. And this is usually an intense, like kind of a uh, computationally intensive part. And then they will proceed to average these updates. So each one has a gradient and they literally just want to obtain the average of these gradients. It's just that the gradients, the, the dimension of the gradients is proportional to the model size. It's actually equal to the model size. So if you have 60 million parameters that you want to train, you'll have 60 million updates, like uh, coordinates at each node, which need to be averaged, okay? So then they update the model and they do this 100,000 times. And after that, they, uh, the, the model will be able to tell apart cats from dogs or, or produce uh, all sorts of text or whatever you want it to do, okay? Uh, at least from, from our perspective, this is kind of all we need to know. So what happens uh, if the model gets larger? And if we start to grow the number of nodes, uh, I'll keep four nodes here, but just assume there are more, more nodes being added sort of below the slide. So uh, essentially we have two things happening. The update, the compute update part will increase because it's kind of linear in the number of parameters or at least linear in the number of parameters, but also this part will also increase because we're sending more parameters uh, and we're also sending to more nodes if we're trying to sort of break uh, break the task into smaller pieces. So the, the unfortunate thing here is that this is linear in two things. It's uh, linear in the dimension, but also in the number of nodes, or at least linear in the number of nodes. Okay, so what happens in the case of really large models and node counts, and this is the case that I showed you before, is that um, this update, this compute update part essentially gets overwhelmed by the averaging part. Okay, so this is the, the problem that one has to try to solve. And the uh, uh, I mean, the real life, I, I should say that, I mean, real life is even more complicated than this. Because of node heterogeneity or data heterogeneity, you might actually have completely asynchronous executions that you're kind of trying to smudge together so, uh, so that the nodes still, uh, so notice that um, like it's the, these kind of uh, round end times don't actually have to be perfectly synchronized. But for the, for the purposes of this talk, I won't talk about asynchrony because I think it would be complicating things a little too much. However, the, there's a ton of work on, on, on just this or kind of marrying the two uh, types of uh, solutions. But what I'll talk about today is uh, kind of the more kind of synchronous um, sort of um, lockstep, the case where we do gradient computation followed by kind of like a compression step and then followed by a gradient exchange of something that's hopefully smaller than what we have to send and then decompress on the other side and update, okay? And we do this and the idea would be that we expect this to be much cheaper than actually having to send the whole thing. And we're looking for solutions which don't affect the running time of the algorithm by too much, okay? So that's, that's kind of uh, the, the general idea. I think I'll stop here for a second and see if there's any questions.
Anything? Um, let me check this. Oh, okay. Everything so uh, other than the volume problem, it seems people are okay. All right. So I mean, a reasonable. So I mean, if if you remember my diagram from before, we kind of understand what the practical problem is. So now we need to model it somehow. Okay. And like, what is really the abstract problem that we, these people are trying to solve? Like, they have two nodes, let's say, or I mean, uh, two can go to infinity. Uh, and they have uh, sort of a partition of the data set at each node. And essentially they have these things which they call loss functions, which is essentially a sum of functions taken over the current value of their model and a set of samples which are located sort of at, at the nodes, okay? So basically this encodes the performance of the, of the model X given the data um, points EI, okay? So now, what, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to minimize the sum, like essentially the, they're, they're trying to minimize jointly over these two loss, loss functions, each one depending on local data, okay? And this inherently introduces communication complexity and we would like to minimize the communication complexity uh, of, of this type of problem. And we kind of get an idea that this will actually depend, for instance, on properties of the functions, because if the functions are very complex, it might actually take us more bits to, to sort of send over this wire, okay? So let me be a bit more specific. So basically, I mean, we're, we're gonna talk about distributing a specific algorithm, which is called gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. So basically uh, we're going to do iterations of this type, like we're, we're gonna do iterations of a, over a parameter X, which is updated via gradients, which are modulated by this thing, which is called, uh, which is a constant and it's, it's called the learning rate. So each node essentially draws a gradient locally, and then they are trying to average their gradients and apply them to each, apply them to their local model. And notice that this will ensure that their local models will stay in sync, okay? So the problem is that this averaging uh, thing needs to be sort of compressed. It has too high transmission cost if we're going to do it in plain text, so to say. So let me um, like go even a bit further with my illustration and give you like a simple mnemonic in case you haven't ever work with, with gradient descent or, or stuff like that. Um, so basically imagine that we're, what we're trying to solve is mean estimation. So essentially node one has a bunch of samples, like d-dimensional samples. You can think of them even as one-dimensional samples, just points. And then what their, uh, their loss functions are just the distance be between their current model estimate X and the set of points that they have locally. So it's essentially, uh, what, what they want to uh, find is some point which sort of minimizes the average distance, uh, uh, the, the average of the distance over, over their joint local points, okay? And in this case, the gradient update uh, that I described before, if you actually work out the math, is actually just becomes that the, the, the gradient itself is just some constant times the literal difference between the local sample and the current value of the model, okay? So basically this happens kind of on both sides. And if we take this, um, like if we take the learning rate to be one over proportional to the number of steps, then you can actually work out that what they're trying to do is literally just uh, average the samples that they've seen so far. So they essentially are trying to, in some sense, send the samples to each other in every step so that, uh, so that they are able to perform this averaging kind of in, in a joint fashion. Of course, this is not what, what machine learning is about, but I'm just trying to provide kind of a simple mnemonic so that every time you see a gradient, you can say, um, you can think of just like the local difference between the sample that you draw and, a, uh, uh, and your current estimate of the mean. Okay, so our problem here becomes that we want to perform distributed mean estimation over many dimensions using very few bits. So that's kind of the, the trick. Okay, all right. So um, I'll maybe take another second to see if there's any questions, but I guess there aren't any, anyone? All right, I hope this is fun. All right, so there are two types of gradient compression methods very broadly. I mean, I, I think there, there's probably three types, but I'll just uh, talk broadly about, uh, about two uh, uh, families. So basically one is quantization. So basically imagine we have a broad, like essentially we have this gradient, which is just, we can see as a set of colors. So each color corresponds to a single dimension. And then the, the idea of quantization is what you would expect. Essentially, we're trying to reduce the set of colors just by rounding 
colors locally to kind of either black or white, where I'm taking sort of light colors to go to white and dark colors to go to black. Okay. I mean, but we have to do it in some reasonable fashion to allow the, the algorithm to still converge. And then the other, the other approach is taking a similar vector. We sparsify it in a smart way. So essentially we're going to select the colors which are kind of interesting and useful to the convergence of the algorithm. And we're just going to send those. And the other ones are just going to, so we're going to save to a buffer or send later. So notice like I, I've just taken these two colors out and this one, but the, the rest stay, stay the same. So the kind of the idea would be to find algorithms which select the right directions for the, which allow, allowing the algorithm to converge. Okay. So let me give you a simple example of a stochastic quantization method, which, which we came up uh, with uh, about five years ago. So um, like what, what's happening is that we have the set of colors and we have, so uh, as, a, as a vector, and then we just go over entries uh, sort of linearly. And then at each entry, we flip a coin, which is biased by the absolute value of the entry normalized by the two norm of the vector. So if we assume that the two norm is, is one, then we're, and the current value is 0 0.4, and we just have two values that we can quantize to, what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, uh, sort of with probability 0 0.4, we're gonna go to one. And with probability uh, 0 0.6, we're gonna go to zero. So the closer you are to the edge, you're the higher the probability that you're going to run there, okay? So uh, this seems simple enough. So in this case, we would go to uh, zero, let's say, and then we go forward and so on. So, I mean, this seems like a very simple kind of randomized rounding procedure, but it turns out it's, it's kind of fairly powerful in this case. So basically the quanti our quantization function formally is uh, going, we're gonna replace the entry by its two, the two norm of the vector times the sign. Uh, the sign is something you usually wanna keep wearing when you're optimizing. And um, this random variable, which is just my, uh, the, the value of my coin flip that I described before. And turns out this has like a few nice properties. So the first is that it's unbiased. So basically the expected value of the quantized thing. I mean, I literally set up the probability so that it's gonna be exactly VI. So in expectation, I'm sending you the right direction even though I will only send you a zero, but if I repeated the, the, this transmission over several times, you on, on the other end, someone would be able to actually recover the value of VI from repeated uh, iterations of this procedure. Now, the other thing that's very important is that if, if I had a certain direction, I don't want to sort of go too far away from this direction. And uh, in, in terms of the length of the, of the gradient vector or the second moment bound of it, it's essentially we have this upper bound on it. So essentially we can only blow it up by at most a factor, a factor of square root D. Uh, even though this, this factor could be quite large. And then finally, and this is where kind of compression comes in, where we're not just making things worse for, for, the, for the sake of making things worse. If you, uh, it's kind of a nice interview question to actually count the non expected number of non-zeros in, in the quantized version of D, and which we can uh, upper bound by square root of D. So what does this mean? I can expect, this means that in expectation, all but square root of n of or square root of d of my entries will be zero. So it means that I will obtain some provable compression. Okay. This is actually at odds with this other thing, which means that I could take a kind of a worse steps uh, by, by, by some non-trivial measure. So what we obtain in terms of SGD theory is that this first property ensures convergence. This property ensures a runtime bound. So we cannot be too much worse than, than the baseline. And the third thing gives us some notion of compression. So what are we actually doing from the optimization perspective? We're relaxing the consistency of the gradients. We're sending kind of a noisy version of, of them. So basically the, the gradient direction, so if I had this gradient direction here from xt to xt plus one, what, I, what I'm trying to do um, sort of pictorially is that I'm trying to send directions which are kind of sparse, right? So I'm just sending, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go this way, then this way. So essentially I'm, I'm trying to preserve some notion of sparsity in this case. And I'm actually making things worse. It takes me more time to go to the same point, but I'm sending less bits at every step, okay? In particular, the, the scheme I just uh, described is not actually very smart because uh, we're running for square root of D more iterations in the worst case, and we're only compressing communication by a factor of square root of D over log N, over log D. But it turns out you can actually do that. 
Okay, so uh, this question is actually something that that kind of motivated us for for quite a while, and we're still kind of working on variants of this, which is like, what is the optimal trade off between the amount of compression inside single gradients and the added variance inside the, the whole thing. So basically, here's a variant of, uh, we can actually obtain a whole trade off depending on how many bits we spend per entry. And in particular, if we, we use uh, order log D bits per entry, then there actually exists um, an encoding, such as the adder number, uh, added number of gradient iterations will be negligible, but we have that uh, guarantee on the expected bit length of each quantized gradient, which is 2.8 times D plus some, co uh, some constant fraction. So why, the, why is this important? Why is 2.8 um, better than anything? Well, we used to be sending 32 bits per entry. So we had 32 times D bit cost in, in total to send a single vector. So we have in some sense a guaranteed compression rate of more than 10x without any, any convergence loss, okay? So it turns out uh, uh, we, we worked on sort of uh, additions of, uh, like it, uh, we've iterated on this idea uh, further and we noticed that for some types of uh, loss functions, you can actually do the entire computation in like in, in low precision. So the, even the, like the gradient computation and the gradient transmission can be all done in low precision. So you can have algorithms which never see the data in full precision, but still converge to the right thing. And this actually got implemented on an on, on FPGA uh, a bit later. So uh, I, one thing that I, I thought was nice, sort of uh, would be nice to outline uh, for the community is that, I mean, the question of whether this variance compression trade-off is optimal. And we kind of know some parts of the answer to this, but, but we don't know the final answer. So uh, the, the scheme that I presented just uh, above, which is called QSTD, can be seen as optimal if your gradients or the inputs to quantization are very small. But if they're large because of this second moment bound blow up, uh, you, you, we don't have, uh, you wouldn't have any reasonable guarantee. However, there exists a family of lattice based quantization algorithms, which can give us this optimal trade off for um, uh, mean estimation. So for, me, for, for the simple problem of mean estimation, we do know what is the right, uh, uh, the, the, the right answer. So this we presented in a paper just a couple of months ago. When more generally, the thing that we've been working on is like what what are exactly the right upper and lower bounds with respect to various types of optimization objectives. So for convex optimization, we believe we kind of know that the answer is you need to send n times d times log of d over epsilon bits. Um, so this essentially says that everyone has to run for roughly this many iterations, d over epsilon, and send d bits. Uh, in each. There's just no way to do it, even if you would second order algorithms or something like that. And what's interesting is that we were able to show in, in work that will appear next month that actually this lower, this, uh, lower bound is tight if you are, um, if, if you're looking at quadratics, uh, quadratic functions, and even for more general sets of functions, if, if you're willing to go to second order algorithms. Okay, so I'll, I won't go into too much detail on, on this part, but I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A uh, after the talk. Okay, so I, I, I mentioned that we do try to close the loop and then we, we sort of go back to, back to practice. So here's, um, here's kind of one application of, of our algorithm, which, which comes out of a paper we published in 2019. So basically uh, we had a collaboration with Microsoft essentially for training their language model. And they have, I mean, even at the time they had a very sizable cluster with uh, tens of nodes and hundreds of GPUs. And they had a very nicely fine tuned version of standard uh, stochastic gradient descent. And we uh, sort of, we uh, provide a new method which had uh, sort of baked in both gradient sparsification and quantization, which is called sparse ML. And uh, basically their baseline time was about uh, 14 days for training the model end to end. And after this, I mean, they could try to use more GPUs but it just wouldn't, it wouldn't scale anymore. It would kind of scale negatively. And by applying variants of, um, uh, variants of this kind of sparse quantized um, communication algorithm, they were able to 
uh, reduced this by about 7x. And I mean, for them, it, this is actually a, a pretty big deal because they're able to try out new algorithms and introduce new data sort of much faster if, if they have an algorithm that doesn't take like half a month to train. So, um, and, and also kind of the scalability of the algorithm with respect to their own setup was, I mean, not, not ideal, but, but it was much better than, than what they had before. Okay, so um, what, what are we working on on, the, on this topic? We're, we're actually trying to develop this kind of complexity theory for distributed optimization by looking at tighter bounds and harder problems. And then we're also looking at efficient methods for model compression as opposed to gradient compression. So speeding up the forward pass as opposed to the backward pass. And then we're also looking at really very bare bones practical applications. So basically, can we help researchers by essentially allowing them to scale on much cheaper hardware rather than, than super expensive um, NVIDIA GPUs, which require a fast interconnect to reduce bad, uh, bandwidth bottlenecks. Okay, so uh, with this in mind, I think I'll sort of um, try to uh, like take a minute to see if there are any questions and then otherwise I'll go to kind of the second part of my talk, which focuses on relaxed concurrent data structures. Are there any questions? All right, I guess not. All right, so um, yeah, all right. So forget everything I said so far. We're gonna, for most of this, uh, for, for the rest of the talk or for most of the rest of this talk, uh, we're gonna look at a, something that looks completely different, okay? So imagine uh, kind of the standard setting in sort of st uh, classical distributed computing where we have a bunch of tasks stored in a data structure somewhere and we have a bunch of threads and we're trying to access these tasks in a, an efficient way, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna do work sharing so the nodes uh, should uh, access tasks in priority order, perform them, and maybe they come up with new tasks which are spawned by, by the ones which they just performed. And then they should get back into the data structure. And we repeat this process a billion times and we know what shortest pass on a graph looks like. Okay, so this is, I mean, uh, I certainly did not invent this. This is uh, uh, kind of a very classical problem. It's the problem of in, like implementing a priority queue essentially. And we, are, we have search, insert, delete, and the kind of critical uh, operation here, which is the delete min operation. And we know that this is extremely useful. So one of the reasons why Windows 10, I think, um, boots faster than Windows 7 is that they have a much better priority queue for, for the boot up process. And then um, graph algorithms such as shortest paths use, uh, we use uh, this, this. I, I don't think I need to talk about that too much, but also in, in chemistry or biology, all uh, event simulations are actually used variants of this abstraction, okay? So we know that known solutions do not perform well because this delete min operation will become very contented in the concurrent case because every thread, if you have lots of threads, a lot of threads will actually end up trying to compete on the same sort of location in memory, okay? So one very nice uh, approach, at least from my point of view, uh, uh, has to, to this has been to relax the, the semantics of the priority queue. So imagine that instead of returning the absolute top tasks to these threads, I would allow inversions. So notice I had one, two, three, four, five. I'm, I'm returning one, three, and five to, to these threads. And two and four are still in the queue. And now it's really a question of whether these had, like these tasks actually had dependencies on the previous ones or whether I, I, I'm fine executing them out of order. Okay. So it turns out this is still useful both in theory and practice and people in graph, uh, so, uh, distributed graph algorithms have, or sorry, uh, so concurrent uh, large scale graph processing have noticed this uh, very, very early on because you can pay for priority inversions via extra work and, and cleanup. Okay, so, uh, and on the other hand, as I'll show you, this is much easier to implement in a concurrent fashion because the, we are kind of uh, flattening the data structure. So we're, we're reducing, the potential for hotspots, okay? So imagine for now that we're looking for a fast, relaxed pro concurrent priority queue. And people have come up with different variants of, of uh, such a data structure. One that I will focus on in this talk, which I thought was very cool when, when I first saw it is what's called the multi-queue. And which I, I think it has been introduced sort of concurrently in multiple communities at about the same time. So basically what the multi-queue does is you know, we have N sequential priority queues, 
imagine that each one is protected by a lock so we don't have to worry about concurrency too much. And then to insert, you just take your task that you want to insert and you just shove it into a random queue, okay? And then if you want to remove, I mean, the, the correspondent of this would be to just pick a queue at random and remove from it. Turns out that's not the best thing to do. We can discuss it later if you want. But what, what people do is they essentially implement this kind of power of two choice type of paradigm. So they pick two queues at random, look at the top elements and lock the one that looks better and, and grab that element. Okay, and if somehow your removal fails before because you couldn't acquire locks or something, you just uh, give up and retry. Okay, pick two, two more, uh, two other uh, elements and, and try again. Okay, so uh, I mean, I, I think I, I don't maybe need to spend too much trying to sort of explain how this works. This is fairly, fairly intuitive. So what, the, the one thing that people notice, and, I, and I've taken this uh, from uh, Rihani's paper is that this scales much better because essentially, I mean, the more threads you have, the more queues you allocate. And I mean, as clearly it works, but uh, I mean, it can, clearly it will scale if you implement things properly. However, so this, this just shows you the throughput with respect to increasing number of threads and increasing number of queues. However, it's really not clear that this is actually, I mean, will this actually give you anything? Because I mean, it could literally lead to arbitrarily bad priority inversions, right? So what we, what, what we tried to focus on for a while was whether this actually guarantees anything. So what we noticed is that you can actually prove something quite strong about, about this, but you're going to get, I mean, you have to be happy with our kind of probabilistic guarantees. So the theorem uh, we had in, in a uh, paper in Potsy a couple of years back now is that if you have n priority queues and you run this system Kind of, we're going to take like a sequential variant of the system for now. And if you run this process with uh, a lot of inserts initially, and then you just do the removes, then uh, even if you run it forever, the rank of the element removed at a given point in time is order n in expectation and order n log n with high probability. So, I mean, this this may seem obvious, but it really isn't. So for instance, like if you were to do single random insert, single random remove, this bound would actually depend on T. So it would get worse as you increase the number of steps. What's kind of nice about this two choice process is that the average bound only depends on the number of, of uh, queues and not on the time for which you're running the process, which I, I thought was fairly subtle when, when, when we first noticed this. So uh, the other thing is that it kind of, it provides a natural randomized relaxation of the sequential data structure because it tells us that you get, remove something that's kind of order number of queues on average but it doesn't actually tell you much about single removals, right? You just get a probability distribution over the guarantees as opposed to a single kind of hard guarantee. Okay, so the analysis is, is not immediate, but it turns out that you can actually generalize it to concurrent executions and other data structures like counters and so on. So you can actually obtain a full family of related data structures, uh, which you can obtain by this sort of copying process plus pair of two choices. Okay, now uh, one thing you may be asking is like, is this actually useful for anything? Because like, and notice like if for some algorithms, clearly even a single out of order execution like of a task could essentially break the algorithm or have require us to rerun the whole thing. Well, it turns out there exists a fairly simple framework in which we can sort of uh, uh, run algorithms using Type, these, this type of relaxed data structure and still obtain some sort of guarantees. So if I give you a set of tasks and I, I build a DAG with N nodes and M edges, where essentially the tasks are the nodes and the edges are dependencies between tasks, then we need to process all, I mean, the, what we want to do is process all of the tasks respecting the dependencies and the priorities, right? Or at least uh, some sort of relaxed version of the priorities, okay? And, um, it uh, turns out you can write greedy graph algorithms like this, like coloring maximal independent set and maximal matching can be very easily written this way. Also Dijkstra's algorithm uh, can also be written this way, just that the graph representation is actually dynamic. So we kind of can, you can't immediately compute it at, at, before running, but also Delaunay triangulation or descriptive event simulation also fit this, this pattern. I, I should say we did not come up with this, with this modeling. This was, uh, Already, uh, already around, but what we did was kind of mess with it a bit. So essentially we 
uh, allowed out of order executions. But basically what happens is if, if I try to ex execute something out of order, so if I try to execute task number three before task number one, I will just have to put it back. I, I essentially pay for it as a kind of, of a, I, I try, pay for this attempt by counting it as a failure, right? So the interesting thing is, I mean, if I have a K relaxed priority queue and trying to execute this sort of relaxed, um, um, like this scheduling task um, in a relaxed fashion, how much do I actually pay? And how much do I actually pay for different sets of uh, natural problems, okay? So one, well, one thing that we, we, we were able to show is that there exists a large class of algorithms where if the dependency graph is sparse, so essentially, um, th th then you're, you're actually going to be able to be quite efficient with respect to the total number of tasks that you executed. So basically, if you have M edges uh, and N nodes, then the o total overhead of relaxation is M over N times polynomial in K. And then uh, what, what happens is that if M is small, like in the order of poly, poly K, for instance, and this is, K is usually the number of uh, threads, which is, which is something that that's kind of small with respect to the number of uh, the number of uh, nodes or edges. Then uh, this can be seen as negligible. One thing that's even more interesting is that for some for a wide set of tasks, for instance, MIS or shortest paths or Delaunay mesh triangulation, you can actually do fine-grained analysis, and you can show that this overhead is always in the order of polynomial in K. So it doesn't actually depend uh, on the input size, which is a property you really would, would want because th this says that the only thing that matters is the number of threads or queues that you're instantiating. And it's not uh, like the, the, there are, in some sense, there are no worst case instances. Okay, so um, yeah. So this says that um, like intuitively it, shows, it says that relaxed data structures can be efficient for these, for these tasks, as long as uh, they do still provide some, some kind of guarantees. Okay, so, all right. So uh, this was kind of, uh, I mean, we're still working in, in this area, but we're, we, I mean, it was kind of a good time to actually go back to practice and see whether we can uh, compete against these kind of very fast uh, heuristic schedulers that people are coming up with in, in systems conferences and in uh, graph processing systems. So we took um, shortest paths, BFS and A star routing. So essentially large scale graph processing tasks and ran them on uh, large, large scale multi-core machines. And then we compared against uh, um, a couple of heuristics which are very well optimized and have uh, ominous names such as OBIM and PMOD. So, um, all right. So, um, uh, our, our method is literally a version of the multi queue where we made some mod uh, modifications so that it's, it's more cache efficient. So, it doesn't always go to a random queue, which, which is not the best thing you could do. So, uh, I have a bunch of graphs here. Uh, I'll probably won't go over each one of them in, in minute detail. But uh, the, point, the point is that we can actually we, we match the performance of these. Uh, tuned heuristics in uh, all of the cases, and we actually can improve upon it by up to two x in some uh, in some instances. And the the interesting thing is that the reason I mean our data structure is not more efficient than a, one of these schedulers. I mean the, these people did an extremely good job of implementing their their uh, data structure. But we where we win is actually if we look at the work increase. So the thing is like these. Uh, Heuristic schedulers usually tend to perform more tasks because in some sense their, their uh, uh, data structures do not have any rank guarantees. So we actually benefit from the rank guarantees uh, in order to perform less tasks. And this is like less overhead tasks. And this is what actually gets us better, better performance. Okay, so um, this is... Um, um, like th th this is kind of where we are on this, but we, we also were able to go back to kind of machine learning applications. And we noticed that even uh, machine learning tasks such as inference on graphical models and in particular BP can also benefit from, from this approach, which, which I thought was um, kind of an interesting surprise. So, all right. So um, I think I'll take a step back from, from the technical part and try to explain kind of where we are right now. and. Uh, where I see kind of uh, a couple of areas where, where things could be could, could become interesting uh, in the near future. So one thing is that, I mean, we, we do have a very good understanding of algorithm, like distributed algorithms and data structures. The, the, the field is extremely 
um, sort of uh, mature and, and robust. But I think there, there's a lot coming from this kind of um, distribution learning um, uh, sort of aware uh, types of data structures and systems. So in particular, there's a lot of work in, in the applied world on trying to get uh, um, sort of um, algorithms and data structures, which kind of try to adapt to their input by learning essentially what their input distribution is. And then uh, at the same time, I think one area that, that I'm really excited by, and I'm very happy to see that um, a lot, uh, there, there's kind of a lot uh, more activity in PodC and DISC and Sirocco and Opa, this is essentially this kind of large scale population dynamics. Sometimes it's branded as population protocols, but sometimes it's, it's kind of opinion dynamics and so on. So I think this is something that's, that's still um, uh, kind of an untapped resource and there are still lots of interesting questions here. And then uh, one thing that I'm really interested in, and I think, I, I really hope that I'm going to be able to get more people interested in this is these efficient algorithms for machine learning. And in particular, uh, one question that's really hot right now is like uh, decentralized learning as opposed to, uh, so basically as opposed to assuming that your sort of communication graph is fully connected and everyone can talk to each other, which is not scalable for, for kind of systems you would de deploy sort of in the real world, then I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of decentralized learning where let's say you have a huge graph and then you're trying to optimize some function jointly but in a very loose fashion over the graph and then another uh, problem that I'm, I'm interested in uh, which is which is related is essentially the problem of efficient inference so yeah that that's pretty much it i, I wanted to sort of end by by thanking my team um i mean I, i've mentioned most of their names already so and as well as our interns and external collaborators and I will think I'll stop here and uh, I'll open for questions. Thank you a lot the speaker. Great talk and we already have some uh, hands raised. Uh, Przemek I think. Hi Dan, thanks for the talk. Uh, always a pleasure hey. to listen to. Hey, uh, nice, so nice to see that you're you're uh, uh, taking my advice and relaxing. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, one question is: so for uh, power of two choices for load balancing, we pretty much uh, understand really well the trade-off between number of choices and the guarantees that you get and you can even go into like one plus epsilon choices and so on do you have something similar for uh, these dynamic processes yeah so uh, i mean i should say uh, first of all uh, i mean it's these things are not the same like we we actually spend quite a bit of time trying to connect the two directly and it it didn't actually work. So the analysis, I mean, we use, uh, in the analysis, we use obviously tools and sort of potentials from kind of more classical load balancing, but turns out this is kind of a dynamic process that's a bit different. Uh, however, to, to um, address your question precisely, uh, so I, th I think what happens is that there's a linear trade-off between N and K. So basically like uh, if you have, like if, sorry, if K is the number of choices that you have, then you can, uh, like your average rank will be something like order n over k, where uh, for instance, in the extreme case where you are actually doing a linear number of choices, then your average rank will be uh, constant. But of course, at that point, you're spending so much time that you might as well just like uh, linearly scan through the uh, choices and essentially make the best choice every time, right? Modulo concurrence. Right. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, the analysis kind of um, almost trivially extends to this case. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. The, the, there is a question from uh, Shantanu Das. Do you think quantum computing can help for the optimization problem in the first part of the talk? Uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, so I, I think quantum computing is actually a very interesting kind of tool that uh, that I think for these, like for for more hard, like for harder discrete problems, I think that this is actually very promising. But notice that the problems that we're looking at here uh, have like hundreds of millions of parameters, which I, in my understanding, at least, is way beyond what what quantum computers can can do right now. Um, but I, I mean, I, I'm here. I'm not uh, an expert on quantum computing, so I, I can't. I can't really say with definite certainty. Um, I mean, the, the other thing that I will mention is that 
these like uh, stochastics first order methods that are being used are extremely good. Like the fact that you can actually um, like optimize over like a million parameter problem in a few hours is is really extremely impressive to me. So I think um, I mean I think whatever new method people might come up with. Uh, it's going to take a while until it actually gets to the level of efficiency where, where it can uh, rival what's what's out there for neural networks right now. Okay. Some more questions or comments? Maybe waiting for some another questions. I, I have a more general question re regarding the, the first part of, of your talk. Yep. You, you said about coming back to practice and it turns out, as, as I have seen in some of your papers, that you are able both to obtain uh, some provable uh, uh, results uh, in contrast to heuristics, which usually, which often uh, do not uh, are are not uh, supported by, by proofs, and and both uh, uh, both more uh, efficient in, in in practice. In some areas of algorithms, it's in particular, for example, in approximation algorithms, is the case that you sometimes obtain some provable um, guarantees, but at the cost that you analyze algorithms, which uh, in practice, in uh, practical yeah. er evaluation work, work worse. So how, how, how often does it happen that you actually can obtain both uh, better provable guarantees and 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 uh, better performance in practice i mean um i, I think uh, w what is kind of lucky at least in, in the in the area of optimization is that the algorithms we're analyzing are still fairly simple um and i think this is also what i mean at least it appears that the entry barrier here is is maybe not so complicated although like the more you stay the more you learn so you you, you need to spend more time but um but i would say that the field is still growing so i mean the algorithms are as i could i mean i obviously simplified a few things in my presentation but the algorithms we're looking at are not much more complicated uh, than than what i described so I think it's it's actually kind of an exciting area because it it doesn't take you years and years of study um, to to actually come to grips with with the current state of the art, where whereas I mean I I, I think I mean it, it's it's in some sense um, you could you could call this a lack of depth because on the other hand for approximation algorithms we have like forty years of of progress and there's like very complex techniques and very very fascinating techniques, but here I think things are just a bit simpler. But I mean, they're getting more complicated rapidly. So I think there will be kind of a natural split. And I mean, to some extent there, there already is where you will actually have to approximate the algorithm or make some simplifying assumptions with respect to what, between what you analyze and what you, uh, what you implement. And I mean, we also make, uh, we regularly make such, such uh, simplifications in our work as well. So um, yeah. But I, I would say it's it's just not at the level of complexity that um, maybe a kind of a Fox paper on on um, sort of SAT would, would be. <laughs> let's say. Do you expect that that it would uh, re require uh, more complexity to obtain also better uh, results in in practice, or or simplicity is the is, is the, the advantage here to some extent? I, I think it really depends. Depends. I mean, uh, to, to some extent, I mean, th th this is kind of a very um, metaphysical discussion, but but uh, I'd say for simple problems, I mean, for instance, uh, for regression, I mean, th there is heavier machinery and like, like second order methods and so on, and it will actually, I mean, it is predicted to work better and it does work better. I mean, what, what's kind of fascinating for deep learning is that, I mean, we have algorithms which should work better and they don't like they're essentially beaten by um, much simpler <laughs> algorithms, which essentially do like the, the, this kind of stochastic gradient descent. So I mean, there are still these mysteries around, but in some sense, this kind of artificially keeps the barrier of entry low, which is why you also see so many people um, sort of uh, being interested in being able to join the area in some sense. We still have time for for one or two questions.
If there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. And we stop recording here. There is a short time to uh, speakers of the next session to prepare and I, and I pass the chairing to